Uh, I just have one small announcement. Uh, we're going to have the next meetup in Facebook on the 21st of October. So if you're looking forward to hear about uh, Foley and whatever C++ they're doing there, please come along. Uh, we'll announce it shortly. Hey everyone, welcome to Aristam for another edition of um, the C++ meetup. Um, just a few words for, you know, about the uh, organization of the place. So um, the restrooms are just as you exit here, this door on the left. First one is uh, for male, the other one for female. As a fire exits, once when you, um, the same way you came in and the one, one, another one on the back. Um, I think that's pretty much it for me. Um, we do a lot of uh, C++ at Arista and we're hiring. So uh, if you're looking for a job, we happen to have one. And, you know, without further ado, I'll hand it over to John to tell us about the secret life of numbers. Thanks. Hi. Okay, does that sound good? Can you hear me? Okay, great. Thanks for coming. Um, um, I should, I can't decide whether to start with a, um, uh, a promotional mention for the uh, conference uh, for which, well, it's one of the reasons that I, um, I, I decided to give my talk this particular month. Uh, maybe I'll leave it till the end, um, but just so you know, there's a, uh, a C++ conference happening in Belfast in a, in a month or two, um, which, and it's a, a very exciting that this will be happening because it coincides with a, um, a meeting of the, uh, the ISO um, C++ committee. Uh, uh, the C++ committee meets uh, three times a year in cities throughout the world, often in the States or, or Europe and other places too. And um, um, we're very lucky that they're going to be meeting in Belfast uh, next time around, um, November 5th to the 10th, I think. Fifth, yeah, around about then. And uh, straight after that, the ACCU, which is the, uh, the UK's uh, associ Association of C and C++ Users, or, or at least that's what it used to be called. It's now just ACU. Um, they will be um, uh, coinciding this with a conference, a two-day conference, immediately the, the the, the two days afterwards and uh, so um some of the uh, well yeah some of the um the the best experts in the world in c++ will be talking at this conference and visiting belfast and uh, so this will be a great opportunity to um, go to a, a conference um if you've not been to a c++ conference before uh, uh, very interesting and uh, stimulating um and as John Kalb, the organizer of CPPCon, says, ask your boss now if you can go to this conference or others. The worst that can happen is that they say no, and uh, the next time they're more likely to say yes. Um, anyway, a little bit about that later on. First, I'm going to give you a sneak peek of the, uh, the talk that I'll be giving, um, The Secret Life of Numbers. I gave this talk in um, uh, Bochum, Germany, in I think February at uh, Embo++, Plus Plus, uh, an embedded C++ conference. And um, uh, I plan to be giving it again in Belfast. And it's not been released, uh, the video of the first um, presentation hasn't been released yet. So uh, um, this is kind of a sneak peek. And uh, um, so I'll, I'll ask if you have any questions or, or comments that you want to make, uh, just stop me as we go along. And uh, okay, I'll get started. Um, so I'm, my name is John McFarland. Uh, I work for um, Jaguar Land Rover over in Shannon. And um, we're, uh, we're always looking for uh, talented C++ developers, by the way. Um, I know it's, uh, it seems like quite remote when you're living in Dublin. Um, the, uh, uh, however, the, it, there's a lot, there's a lot to say about uh, County Clare and uh, and uh, the west of Ireland, in particular, much, much, much cheaper rent and house prices. <laughs> yeah. uh, just, just saying, just uh, FYI. Okay. Um, uh, so my background, just nerdy stuff. Um, uh, for a long time, my first computer was a, a BBC Micro. Uh, uh, 
And um, yeah, uh, my first uh, CPU is a 6502. Uh, I've since um, kind of mostly specialized in C++. Uh, I love other languages like Python too. And uh, I've worked in games and uh, currently see work in automotive. So this is the uh, the structure of this talk. It's like a not a, an anti-talk, really. Uh, most of my talks up until now have been sort of poorly prepared and like uh, rather wooden. So I just thought I would mess around for an hour in this talk. So um, please don't take all of it too seriously. If you don't get all of the answers right, don't feel too bad. There will be there will be uh, tests as we go. So to begin with. The parts of a number. I, I thought maybe I should have called this uh, talk the shape of a number because uh, I'm just picking a random movie titled uh, Ape. And uh, really, what I'm going to share with you today is my view of what a number is, what it kind of actually looks like in my head. Um, because I sit out difficulty explaining this to people sometimes. I realize maybe it's not obvious. So we're going to ask a, several questions as we go along. Um, to begin with, so if you're familiar with uh, a uint 8, does everybody know what that is? Basically, a byte, um, a signed 8-bit, an unsigned 8-bit integer, typically an unsigned char in C and C++. Uh, it's made of digits. Uh, how many digits are there in a, a uint 8? Uh, eight? Eight? A design bit. A sign bit. So this is this is specifically uh, unsigned. Yeah. So uh, we're starting off. We, we'll get to the sign bit. I promise you. Don't worry. And, uh, no, I'm not trying to catch anybody out. There's no trick questions here. Okay. So well, let's look. Here's uh, here's a number. Can anybody figure out what this number is before I carry on? It's uh, one that uh, people just pick. Seems to get picked an awful lot. Picked on an awful lot. 42. So how do, how do we make this up? Well, it's all about these uh, these bits that are set to 1 here, and they have values 32, 8, and 2, which make 42. All right. However, the, there are a whole bunch more digits, and they're not, uh, they're not stored because there's enough of them that you wouldn't be able to store the number 42 on any computer. There's an infinite number of... Uh, leading um, implied bits. And one of the first things we're, I mean, we're taught how to count using with one decimal digit before we ever learn what the tens and the hundreds are. And so we're sort of taught to forget about these before we've even learned about them. But they're there, and um, they're, uh, they're, they're assumed. And provided they are zero, uh, we kind of have this really awesome compression when you think about it. within within this uh, eight, eight uh, bit digits, uh, we can store any number as long as, it, as long as the ones are confined to those eight. And uh, to the right, um, trailing digits uh, past the decimal point there, and we'll definitely be getting to that later. Um, again, many, many zeros. And as long as they are zero, this thing is kind of perfect. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, without loss of precision, it's, uh, it's modeling the value 42. And those are, the, uh, those are the digits that really, really matter, the ones that are set on. These other zeros, we can do without them, uh, as we'll get to. So how many digits in a uint 8? It's actually an infinite number to the um, of leading zeros, then 8 that we're actually storing, and then another infinite. So it's actually 2 infinity plus 8. So you were all very, very wrong. Not just very wrong, very, very wrong. But uh, don't worry, I'm sure this will improve as we come along. OK, so, right, here we go, the sign bit. You ready? Uh, how many um, sign bits, specifically sign bits, in an int 8? Notice I'm saying uh, bit instead of digit. I kind of treat these two terms slightly differently. Well, one. one. OK, that's a guess. All right. Thanks. Right, one. I think one. Okay. All right. Let's see. <laughs> okay. Well, so what's what's this number? 
Uh, and remember, so we're talking about int eight now, which is a signed eight bit integer signed char, possibly, <clears throat> typically a byte that's using two's complement. Very good. Yeah, I'm pretty predictable. So here, this is, it really wasn't that long ago that I, I discovered this particular way of thinking about the, the um, sign bit here. It's the same, it's the same as with an unsigned integer, but the, uh, the value that it brings to the, the overall number is negative. So you start with this very low number and you slowly work up towards zero. You can never quite get there. Like, you know, if all the bits are set on, you know, this and then all these other bits nearly gets to zero again, but not quite a negative one. Um, but yeah, it's quite a, it's a, I, I like this way of uh, thinking about two's complement. And, and uh, yeah, that's the, the prevailing way that we, um, uh, we represent negative numbers with bits. And so now we have all these um, leading ones. <laughs> well, well, hear me out. You know. um, and uh, yes, now because this bit here is set to one, um, this, com this infinite compression, this, uh, this kind of uh, abstraction only works so long as you know, all of these things are ones. If any of them are not one, then we now are failing to store negative 42 in this very um, uh, efficient way. And still zeros to the right there, still uh, trailing zeros there. They all have to remain zero. Uh, we, we could get into what, what do you have when you have all, what, like a system where you have all ones there. There's some interesting things that could happen, but we're not gonna go into those. So now these are the, the salient um, digits, um, or the salient bits in our number, because we now, as before, we have we have the five uh, digits used to store 42, but then we have this extra digit to say whether the value is negative or not. Yes. Well, we can uh, have uh, four ones after, uh, after the first. Yeah. And one zero at the end. And one. It will be completely with complement. OK. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. We could, yeah. When I when I was making this this slide, I was sort of thinking about you know what 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 it, what if we did use ones there? We could take away one of the ones here and say, well, this one, sorry, this digit now can be used to can have a zero or one, um, and we we shift the decimal point over here. And now that that can say that we have, you know, for instance, a 0.9 recurring as a value, for instance, which could be very useful in some situations. Uh, but that's as far as I got with this. I, people probably have thought about this, haven't they? Not just not just you and I, but, but it, it, I'm sure it has been thought about. Um, however, it's not something that's used an awful lot. In, in uh, you know, you're not so likely to come across it, I think, uh, when you're dealing with sort of modern architectures. But yeah. Right. <coughs> right. An infinite number of ones followed by a zero. Yes, is the perfect complement. Is the is the was the comment? Uh, yes. Uh, so this is very, it's a very kind of a engineering um, naive um, interpretation of numbers. I'm not a mathematician, um, and it, it does show. But yeah, oh, interesting point. Okay, so. How many sign bits? How close did we get there? Did you say one? So, well, infinity plus one. There you go. So only, only off by infinity. All right, so pi. So it's always a good one. Um, incidentally, in C++ 20, pi is finally, will finally be standardized. You can say stood pi of double, so you're using double. Um, Pi, E, and various other um, mathematical constants or numeric constants uh, are now standardized as of next year. A long time coming. Anyway, today we're going to ask how many significant digits in pi. And, uh, any guesses how many significant digits there are in pi? Sorry? Infinite. Infinite. Okay, well, so given 
given the, the previous answers, are you thinking maybe something with infinity in it is, uh, is, is likely to get you closer? You think it's going to get the right answer, though? All right, let's take a look. All right, so there's, um, there's a sum of pi. Not, not the sum of pi. There is some pi. Not much, but, but the most important bits, the, the most important digits. Um, that was in binary. And of course now we need, so we know that we're talking about a positive number. We have this extra um, bit here. I kind of I call these digits, and I tend to describe this one as a bit there. Um, that's, uh, if, if you've ever used uh, the numeric limits um, class template, it talks about the number of digits versus uh, as opposed to bits, and that's where I get this from. But think of these as digits. And there, there's our dot dot our ellipsis there. They keep going on forever. So yeah, so you, you, you might be, who knows, maybe you got this right. And then, the, and then all the leading zeros, they fortunately they're all zeros, so this works. Uh, obviously, we're not going to be able to store exactly pi very easily anyway, but still. Okay, so how many significant digits? The answer, one um, sine bit. It's not really a sign bit. I mean, there are types of integers that aren't two's complement that actually do have a sign bit. This is something slightly more tricksy than a sign bit, but we kind of call it a sign bit. Okay, then two, two uh, uh, integer digits, and then infinity. So you, um, you've got as close as anybody so far to the right answer. <laughs> but Cantonian mathematics actually No. No, no, it's one plus two plus infinity. Say, <laughs> it, so look, I've, that, I've reduced it down. It's infinity plus three. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's infinity plus three. Okay. <laughs> um, no, is it expensive? <laughs> How many rooms does it have? <laughs> I should have. I should have guessed. Okay, so. So floating point, we uh, we managed to introduce uh, pi without even talking about floating point numbers, um, and they they deserve a mention. Uh, one particular thing that's very cool about them that uh, um, you may or may not know: uh, how many digits in a float? Come on, I'm, I'm and I'm talking to float here, not double or long double. So this is a. Uh, and, and let's say we're talking IEEE 754, uh, 31, 21. Well, let's take a look. Um, well, here's pi again. There's, um, there's our leading zeros. Interestingly, um, with floating point, because you know that the most the most uh, significant digit that you store is always going to be a one, right? We don't we don't store up to here in a in a in a float ever. We only store up to here, and uh, say we double half this number, we move the, the decimal point. We don't just have a zero in this place here if we have the the value, and so that one isn't stored in the float in the actual bits of the the floating point number. So we get, oh, what is it now, is it 20, it's 23 digits, 23 bits that are actually stored in the mantissa of, of a float. And then this one is implicit. It's just added on when you're trying to calculate what the actual value is, which is kind of kind of neat. So, so well, there's obviously the, the zeros there, plus the this one digit that's implicit, and then the 23 that are actually stored. And then, then all the zeros, because uh, the zeros to the right, and you only get an approximation there. Uh, actually, any floating point uh, experts in the room? It occurs to me, in a, in a fully conforming um, floating point implementation, I think you get one or two um, very low significant bits that are never stored in memory, but are only kept in register. Uh, <laughs> They are 80 bits, yes. Right. And, on, and I think on Windows, that's still what a long double is in MSVC. 
I said it used to be. Yeah, but uh, and and for a long time, your calculations would happen in 80 bit, but then gets written out as 64 bit, which could cause problems. But, um, but yes, and there's a whole history there. But there's an extra one or two bits, kind of uh, stored in on on the uh, on the FPU. Apparently, there's a really great talk by uh, John Farrier uh, in CppCon 2015. If you if you look that up. He talks for an hour on floating point, and it's a, it's a really good primer um, in, into that whole area. Um, there's far more complication than, the, than I've gone into here, but just that one that that one digit there, I kind of it's my favorite digit in the uh, the floating point value. It's the one that's not stored. Okay, and I've added it all up for you because uh, clearly you're terrible at the sums, the lot of you. All right, so. Garbage bits. Um, so what the so the the if you store um, an eighty bit floating point value into a sixty four bit, yes you can, and then you read some different sixty four bit um, double that um, float into that register. Yes, uh, I'm not sure if that's still the case. It, it clears them, but it, but it possibly used to not do that. Yeah, I th all sorts of, so the, the 80 bit, the whole 80 bit um, floating point thing used to cause all sorts of problems, particularly if you wanted deterministic behavior out of your code. Yep. You certainly, right, generally, if you want, um, uh, if you want predictable uh, results, particularly across compilers and, and systems, then if, say, you have an 80-bit uh, floating point register, each time you perform a calculation, you've got to write it out, to, potentially, you've got to write it out to memory and read it back in, in order to deliberately truncate those additional bits. Um, and this is the thing, if you use the, like the, the, the fast math switch in GCC, you're telling it not to do stuff like that and saying, I don't mind so much if my code isn't completely deterministic. And you can get much, much faster code, a much faster performance as, as a result. But uh, yes, uh, floating point is it's really um, uh, easy to work with in a lot of ways. It, it, it's, it abstracts away a lot of problems for you, and it's great. Um, but it's it's really expensive and complicated to un understand it fully. Um, it's uh, quite a task. Uh, I, I certainly don't. Um, <laughs> which is why um, fixed point arithmetic is uh, often a a great alternative. Which is kind of why I'm here. It's a fixed point. Okay. So how many times does forty two go into eight? Um, <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so here is a value 42 again. I've skipped a few of the zeros on either side to fit it into the slide, um, but that's that's it. And there's the, the bits that we decided we absolutely really need. Okay, so this is how um, they're stored typically in a um, an int 8 or a uint 8, a, an 8 bit integer of, of one kind or the other. And there, see, we have those zeros that we're not actually really using. Um, but the important thing is these ones are there, and so our value is correct. Okay, here's an alternative way that you might want to store, store the number. What am I doing here? There's a zero now being one of the digits is actually stored. Um, on the, the wrong side of the uh, the radix point here. Um, and that's just rather like with floating point, I've shifted the number by one digit. So perhaps this eight bits um, can be stored. So, you know, 84 will be the, the value if you looked at this, this byte. But we're saying, okay, well, the meaning of it is that uh, each, 
this bit is worth a half, this bit's worth one and two and so on. It's, uh, it's scaled down by a half. And here's another way that you could use a byte to store 42 again, uh, where you just have these uh, the digits off on this side. Um, this is the, the one that I would favor um, for reasons I, I'm not sure I, I, I fully explain. But uh, well, say you add, add one to, to this value uh, or, or, or multiply it by four, for instance, you know it's still going to fit into this, just about fit into this number. Whereas if you multiply this, this number by four, you start getting ones here, you start getting overflow. We'll get onto overflow later. But just take it from me. If you can choose where the radix point goes and you're storing your numbers and in integers, I found this is the best way to store it with all the those spare zeros being leading zeros, not trailing zeros. All right, so how many times does four go into eight? The answer is three. One, two, three. OK. okay. Uh, by the way, the, the sequel to this talk will be division. I will just talk about division. And it'll be kind of uh, therapy for me, because division is the uh, it's the it's the it's the, the meanest, the toughest, the hardest of the of the four basic arithmetic operations. But um, yeah, it'll it'll kill you. Okay, slide code ahead. Um, none of the stuff I'm about to write you should ever copy and paste into production code or anywhere else. Uh, it won't build anyway because it's missing all of this stuff here. Uh, also, you should generally try to avoid using these too much anyway. Um, but uh, yeah, just so you know. And also, always turn up your warnings on your compiler. Um, and I'm optimizing everything because I'm going to show off some assembler now as we go on. Beg your pardon? You're not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I missed pedantic. Yeah, and pedantic actually really isn't that difficult to, to turn on. And if you, particularly if you start a fresh project, turn these on and, and doubly pedantic as well. And um, uh, it'll really help you avoid uh, some mistakes. OK, so types. We're going to talk about types now. Right. These things mean something, by the way. This one, um, this is to do with the uh, the templates that are coming up. I can't remember what the last one is. I think it's just bit, bits. Um, I spent as much time on these as I did on the rest of the slides. Um, so. OK, question. How do you write 42? Um, that's just too open-ended for, for me to even try and canvas uh, suggestions from you, really. But um, I mean, how do you write it? There are, we just have our own culture and conventions for how we write 42. They're one of a probably an infinite number. OK, well, I'll show you how I write 42 uh, with uh, my library, CNL. The comp Compositional Numeric Library, uh, freely available on the inter interwebs. Um, please check it out and tell me what you think. Um, I'll even respond to uh, bug reports. OK, so the first type from this library that I'm going to introduce is fixed point. Uh, it's actually an alias, but it's, it's easier for now to think of it as a, as a class. Um, does, has anybody here used um, the the chrono duration library, it's part of the, the standard library. It's a, it's a time library. And uh, what it does, it, it represents um, numeric values specifically with the, the purpose of uh, representing time and, and duration and dealing with, with those things. Um, and what it does is it, uh, it stores, it kind of wraps one number in a class. And we're doing a similar thing here. So here's a part of this uh, class, this imaginary class called fixed point. Um, and privately somewhere there, whatever the rep, the rep type, the represent, representational type, the type we're using to represent the value under the hood, that's stored in there privately. And so this thing is going to be some kind of abstraction over an int or what have you. And then we have these other two parameters. This one, radix, you can ignore for now. Um, uh, Eugene. Where's Eugene? OK, you can, sorry, I, ho I hope I didn't wake you. you. You don't need to wake up just yet. But, uh, 
exponent. Um, that one we will be looking at. And so radix is defaulted to two because binary fixed point is is, uh, is uh, what people generally um, want to use the most. And here's, here's how you get the value of a fixed point type. You take n, you multiply it by, multiply it by radix, raised to exponent. So by default, two to the zero, that's one. So if you, if you just default these parameters, um, you're just going to get basically something that behaves just like, like rep does. Um, it's difficult, uh, well, at least I find it difficult to, to understand what any of this stuff might mean without examples. And uh, I can't remember. I'm hoping I provided some. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, it can't be less than two. Yeah. Uh, um, because it's a quantity, and there's, it's better in C and C++ if you represent quantities using a signed integer. And again, I've done a lightning talk on this, by the way, which... Uh, Oh, maybe I could uh, to fill in some time as, as if this isn't going to go on long enough. Uh, yeah, I could uh, I could rant for at least five minutes. I know I can on why this should be uh, signed in, not unsigned. Um, but yes, perfectly valid question. If you're performing some arithmetic with this uh, uh, and um, you're using any other signed integers, things get messy when you start mixing signed and unsigned. And that's just one of the of, of various reasons why it's uh, better to represent quantities in these languages uh, using a signed integer. It's also more efficient. And uh, well, actually, we'll get back to that in a bit. So here's 42 again. Here's the, uh, these, the six important digits. OK, so here's one way you might write 42 um, using an 8-bit signed integer, like so. Here's the, the new. Uh, uh, uniform initialization. One of the, instead of uh, coming up with a terrible, incomprehensible name for a C++ feature, uh, the committee decided with this one to just go for bitter irony. So we have the uniform initialization. Anything but uniform. But uh, this is how I recommend you'd you'd express 42 uh, as an expression if you want it to be uh, signed 8-bit like so. Um, not the way I would do it, though. Certainly, if I'm going to show off my library, here we have a uh, fixed point. Um, uh, and we're, here's the rep value. So we're going to use uh, a byte to, to store this value. And we're going to use exponent one because, hey, we don't need this zero here. So let's, let's shift everything along by one. Is that, is that the best way to do it? Well, let's take a look. So uh, here now is uh, some. Some examples of the uh, the uh, um, the code that's generated by this library, and here we have um, a. You think of this as like the, the the constructor. If we take a floating point value here, um, and uh, we want to convert it to our fixed point type, well, here is the um, here is the assembler that that is produced. Does this assembler look familiar to anybody? Does anybody here read a, read or write assembler at all? Okay, a few, a few. Um, does anybody recognize what kind of assembler this is? Bear in mind, I mentioned uh, I was at an embedded conference when I first wrote these slides. So um, it's ARM. It's not Intel. So uh, I can barely understand Intel assembler enough to know whether I pessimized my code in, in, uh, in isolated cases. Um, but here, actually, I started making these slides for Embo. Uh, with virtually no familiarity with ARM assembler, and I realized uh, ARM is actually quite—it's quite readable. And nowadays, hardly anybody writes ARM, but um, particularly with the the advent of Compiler Explorer, it's a lot more common to read assembler. And um, so I was going through these, and uh, here we have a—you know—the floating multiplication there. I'd have to look this up, but uh, yeah, the push and the pop—they make sense. Um, and then anyway. It only makes a certain amount of sense, I'll admit. Uh, okay. So, okay, so here is like the, this is the equivalent code if we didn't want to use uh, my library and we weren't going to use this fixed point type. 
this is um, this is what that code does. It takes um, the value that's input and it uh, multiplies it by a half. In other words, it's converting it to well, it's, it's converting it to the internal amount. So that's two to the negative one, not two to the one, because two to the one is is the way that we get the the value back out. And you'll notice, oh dear, there's uh, there's a few extra instructions here. Um, and if I recall correctly, um, coming back to the, uh, the the situation where we were storing a, a, an 80-bit floating point value in a 64-bit uh, memory, um, here we're, I think we're uh, we're sort of making sure that a lot of our bits are zero. Is that right? That's any? Do we have any uh, ARM assembler experts in the room? All the back in order to flush the make sure the zeros are filling the 24 bit digits there, right? Um, and well, what does this tell us? Well, maybe don't use um, 8 bit ints. Oh, by the way, all, all of these have links, uh, I haven't tested them in a while, but uh, um, are they going to load up? Do they still work with my library? <coughs> Why did I do this? This was foolish. Yes, it works. Excellent. Yeah. Because I don't know if uh, what I'm saying makes any sense until I test it in uh, Compiler Explorer. And who's heard of Compiler Explorer? Yes, isn't it great? Um, one thing to note, uh, is this isn't a very good um, example to demonstrate, but you see this, this checkbox here, A dot out, you can now run your code as well as seeing the assembler output. As of a few months ago, you can now also uh, execute it, which is which is great news. It's uh, such a great website. Okay. All right. So what happens if we use int instead? Here yeah. and int here, we get our nice code because when we don't have to worry about um, flushing those twenty four zero digits. Um, well, they don't. They are necessarily zero, are they? Because it's a uh, uh, two's complement, so they might all be ones. They might all be zeros. I'm sure if if we were using unsigned here, yeah, that that would be um, unsigned eight bit int. Certainly might be more efficient than uh, a signed eight bit int. Um, but uh, yeah, straight away going to int, which is the machine width. It's uh, on on any platform. It may not always be thirty two bits, but that that will be because your CPU is not most comfortable um, operating on numbers at thirty two bits. On some machines, I think I mentioned Cray supercomputers at the last um, C plus plus Dublin user group meeting that I was at, and and said how a shorts and and uh, and chars and ints were all sixty four bit, and somebody corrected me and said no, actually Cray has moved to GCC. So, uh, but anyway, I'm sure if you like you dig out your oldest MS DOS uh, C plus plus compiler, um, you may find sixteen bit ints. Um, but the point is, int is just whatever is um, best for that particular platform. And uh, this kind of bothers people if, if you don't know exactly how many digits um, int is, what's the use of it? Um, but certainly, it, uh, the CPU, uh, your, your CPU will like you if you use int rather than try and save memory. Save memory once you're writing out to, um, to RAM. Don't try and save memory whilst you're using the, the, uh, the CPU itself. Okay, rant over. <laughs> well, more or less. Okay, so so we decided that this uh, using a, uh, an eight-bit integer to store this number is not the best. And again, sure, if you're going to store millions of these, if these are RGB values, yeah, you might think again. But uh, uh, unless unless you have to think about it, don't think about it. Use int. So, is this the best way to store this number? Well, okay. Uh, now I'm going to introduce, uh, you may have noticed that namespace literals on my uh, slide code warning page. Um, our literals, I don't know who's familiar with uh, user-defined literals, but uh, who, who's heard of UDLs? Um, so here we have uh, this um, suffix, um, underscore C, and uh, this is a C++11 um, feature, which is really quite groovy. You can say so if you if you're familiar with the um, 
trying to declare a number that's um, maybe you say the value of 5 billion, you can't store it in the 32 bit integer. You need to uh, suffix the number with LL to make it clear that that's a long, long value. Um, that's part of the language, but you can now add your own suffixes to numbers. Right. Again, I wouldn't know what the heck I was talking about right now without seeing some examples. So here's an example. Um, it's using this, uh, this bit of uh, um, plumbing here to allow me to declare um, a value 24 um, constant, like so. And what that actually um, results in is a, a type called constant 42. Notice 42 is in the uh, angle brackets there. It's actually part of the type. Uh, has anybody uh, heard of uh, stood integral constant? Um, it's a, uh, it's a, a template, um, class template, which uh, stores a value actually as one of the template parameters to its type which seems like an odd thing to do, but it's actually incredibly powerful. It means that the compiler um, uh, knows that the, the thing is representing the value 42, and it can do um, really quite powerful things with that. One of them I'm going to demonstrate now. So fixed point 42, I now um, create, uh, I initialize the value fixed point 42, uh, uh, um, a variable a. Um, using um, class template argument deduction. So basically I say, hey, this is a some fixed point um, type, but you've got to figure out from the thing with which I'm initializing it what the, what the uh, parameters, the template parameters are. And it looks at this. The compiler can see that it's value 42. It knows that it doesn't need that odd digit. And so it configures out that it can use the experiment one, which as I mentioned earlier is a, a preferable way to, to store such numbers. Um, so at compile time, uh, with 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 figuring out the the optimal way to store forty two here. So we have uh, like this old meme. It's getting quite tired now, to be honest, isn't it? Yes, this is a bit better. Uh, yes, int is much better. But using um, I used to find literal like so. Um, I'll get to exactly why this might be useful when we get to dealing with overflow. But yeah, this is, trust me, this is the best way. Also, it looks quite nice. Do anything that's that kind of is, is a bit cleaner? There's fewer brackets. Um, if you use C++, you, hopefully you like brackets or you don't, at least, at least don't have an allergy to them. But still, fewer is generally better. Sorry, John, mm -hmm. if, you, if you had changed that six point, the last one, yep. six point to eight billion under four C. Eight billion. Do you get, does it suddenly switch from using fixed point inch to fixed point long or uh, anything clever like that? Uh, or I presume could. Uh, it certainly could. Fixed point is concerned with um, what's happening on, on the right hand side of the, of the, the number, where the, where the radix point is going to be. There is another type that I'll get to in a bit that deals with the overall width of the number. And then we'll see how how eight billion might be represented. Certainly, if you put um, if you put forty one into this, then our exponent will have to be zero. And if you put eighty four in, this exponent is going to be two. But overflow is a separate concern from a, from scaling numbers. And uh, one thing, a lot of fixed point uh, when when people try and um, come up with a, a fixed point library, they quickly realize our overflow is a problem, rounding is a problem. They try and throw the kitchen sink. At the problem of representing real numbers with integers, and um, so I'm trying to separate every single concern into a, a different type. A fixed point, all it does is scale the numbers. If it gets something that's out of bounds, um, uh, this this isn't the type that will deal with that. But to be honest, I've forgotten exactly what will happen here. I think this is, uh, um, yeah, I think it will just overflow. Um, but you will get a compiler warning, or at the very least. Um, a sanitizer error. Okay, so how do you write 42? This really nice, lovely way here. Um, do we get kicked out at any time? Because I'm probably, um, if I don't know that I'm uh, I'm uh, time constrained, I do tend to waffle on. So, nine, okay. Okay, that's half the information I, I need. Okay, uh, right, it's eight. Okay, I'll try, not, I'll try for us to not be here till nine. Okay, so 
times they are changing. I just love uh, puns. Sorry. Uh, so how many bits in a megabyte? OK, well, back to the uh, questions. The simple questions, really. These are easy questions. How many bits in a megabyte? Eight, eight million megabyte, yes. Well, you've, did, you didn't fall into the trap of confusing megabytes with mebibytes. That's something. Eight, eight million bytes. That's an awful lot, isn't it? I mean, that's a big number. I know we've been dealing with some big numbers today, but that's a lot. Uh, okay, well, let's see if you're right. No, oh, you don't know that. You might be right. Okay, here's one million. Um, uh, big M here for millions. I think that's a, that's a French thing. Um, and one million, one way to think of it is a thousand multiplied by, you think it's a thousand times a thousand? Well, of course it is, yeah. I don't know why you didn't all shout that out. It's really obvious, good grief. All right, so how does that look in binary? Well, there's a thousand. Okay, we've, we've, we've skipped the, the two's complement bit there for a second, but just ignore that. A thousand times a thousand. Okay, now we're in, we're in binary now. Uh, we had we had decimal and binary on the same confusing screen there, so it's not confusing now. Okay, and this is what um, this is what a, a million is in binary. Um, there are lots of ones up here, not so many down here. You notice there's uh, there's three kind of unused uh, digits uh, trailing zeros here, and three trailing zeros here. And you know I don't like trailing zeros. I certainly don't want to waste memory on them. And do you notice there's six trailing zeros in the product of, of a thousand times a thousand? Is that a coincidence, do you think? Is that a coincidence? No, it's not. No. Uh, anywhere there's a pattern, there's an opportunity. Okay, there's those zeros. What are we going to do with them? Okay, well, so here's, um, here again is, I'm using my user-defined literal, 1,000 constant. Um, and when we initialize a fixed point this way, um, the comp compiler knows to get us back a type that has exponent three. It knows that we are not going to use those lower three digits. And when fixed point values are multiplied together, we add the exponents. So when we do k times k, we get a fixed point um, number with um, exponent of six. That's, you know, basically, it's it's avoiding wasting those digits. Um, and again, uh, the way that a lot of fixed point um, libraries are designed, particularly ones before C plus plus eleven, um, before C plus plus eleven, there wasn't this wonderful auto keyword. And so, you'd have to be figuring out this type for yourself. You couldn't just leave it to the compiler to do. And that was too much bother for most library designers. And so they'd tend to say, okay, well. We'll just say the result is uh, three, but that turns out to be less efficient. Um, uh, and I'm hoping to have a slide now explaining why. Um, actually, I will just jump here and see if this stuff checks out. Unfortunately, it doesn't produce any source code whatsoever because it's all const extra. It just proves these are all proofs. Oh dear. Oh, I will fix this later. Okay. Anyway, assembler coming up in a bit. So how many bits in a megabyte? Answer. Oh, I forgot now. So that's what? What is this? Like primary school? Uh, I hate you infinity plus one. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so at 14, seven plus seven, it's 14, right? No, because uh, none of you guessed 14, so it can't be right. No. Now there's a better way to do this. Uh, Eugene, you still here? Yeah. Hi. Okay, so one million, I mean, what, you know, what, what what does this, these numbers, what do they scream out at you? What, what particular count, counting system? Decimal. And I said, uh, I said there's a, our radix point. So here we have, if we look at the same kind of pattern, but with decimal eyes, 
Yeah, we just have individual ones here and a whole load of uh, zeros, a lot of zeros, way more zeros than ones. Of course, now they're decimal. Okay, don't, don't forget that. Because um, that does look a bit like binary, doesn't it? Um, so here we go. Here is the, uh, the exponent, uh, sorry, the radix value 10. So instead of being 2, instead of being the default value, we're using 10 here. And really, um, all I ever work with is uh, 2 and 10. I haven't, I've barely ever tested whether this stuff even compiles with, say, base 3. Um, but it probably would. Uh, 16 might be interesting, but not very. But yeah, you can't do base pi as well, uh, just, just in case anybody wondered. Um, all right, so here, uh, we get the same, the same rule being applied. We now have fixed point um, with exponent 6. And so the value being stored in here is, uh, um, well, we'll get to it, but the, the, the assembler output of this is, is very nice. Um, but how many bits in a megabyte now? Answer one, one bit megabyte. Okay, not was it eight, eight million? What were you thinking? Eight million. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. This is better, though, isn't it? I think. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I did do. I did uh, write this talk for an embedded conference. I mean. Uh, here you might you might actually store values in the eight million bit numbers. I don't know. Okay. Okay, root planning. Okay, this one's fun. This one's fun. Okay, how far does the queen really move in chess? Who who's heard of the game chess? Yeah, less than half the room have heard of the game chess. <laughs> Come on, uh, audience participation is the best. You love it. Okay. All right. So um. Uh, this is kind of funny. Who, who's heard of the Manhattan distance? Uh, anyone? Yes, that's where you count across and up, like the number of uh, the distance if you had to catch a cab from one corner in Manhattan to another is called the Manhattan distance because it's how far along plus how far up, east and north or what have you. Well, this is this is funny because this is we're going to talk about the Queen's distance today, and uh, who knows their New York geography? The Queen's distance. Queens? Yeah? No? All right. Tough crowd. All right. So anyway, if... Sorry? Seven. Seven. <laughs> yeah, but that... Are you saying this distance from here to here is the same distance as from here to here? Do you want to rethink? <laughs> I've even... Really? How, how, how far does the queen really move? <laughs> I even like in the very same slide, I like I gave you the, the like a, a, a diagram showing you how far the queen moves. I actually, it, it, it couldn't have been easier to get right. I mean, I, I'm trying so hard with you people. Okay. All right. So here's the root two. Uh, well, some of root two, not all of root two. Hardly any of root two, actually. The important bits, yeah. Okay, I haven't got the, I, we, we stopped talking about assigned bits for now. 1.414. Uh, if you don't recognize this number, it's because uh, you were all, of course, taught binary in, in uh, primary school. <laughs> this is how much, if you are going to try and cram as much of root two into a, a, uh, an int, an int 32, this is the, the most you could cram into there. Um, and then, yes, we really do need the, uh, the two's complement bit there to be zero, so that we know this isn't a negative value. And then we have 32 bits. OK, and uh, I mentioned uh, uh, we now have uh, a numeric constants in the standard. And this is uh, one of them, square root 2. Um, in C++20, you'll be able to say um, std colon colon square root 2 of float a float, and you'll get some number approximating this thing. Um, you won't get fixed point because fixed point, unfortunately, is not in C plus plus twenty, but uh, maybe maybe twenty three. Who knows? But anyway, this is a uh, this is great news. Uh, square root pi. These things uh, we haven't had a standard way to represent them before. I mean, you could say uh, you know a, a tan 
half, is it? Uh, um, eight and forty-five to to get some of these things, but uh, you may not always get the every last bit of precision, uh, and that's what these constants also give you. And you can you could ask you could put in float double or long double in here. Um, uh, in fact, if you get a Godbolt, um, G, the latest uh, version of GCC already has this uh, functionality supported. Um, here in CNL, I've um, specialized, um, so instantiated um, square root two constant uh, for my fixed point type, and um, and this is what you this is what you're going to get out. This is what the bits are going to look like. So the minus thirty here. We're now, we're now dealing with negative exponents because we're having fractional digits. There's 30 fractional digits there. Uh, hopefully, it's uh, relatively intuitive. Uh, feedback always uh, appreciated. OK, so um, uh, guess what art package I used to, uh, to draw this? Well, basically, I stole, the, I stole the chessboard from somewhere on the internet. And then I drew with as straight a line as I could in um, the GIMP. Has anyone heard of the GIMP? Uh, I couldn't find where to draw a straight line in the GIMP. I think it's like a plug-in or something, because that's the GIMP. All right, anyway, so um, obviously the... Uh, and also, okay, this is the distance to the king. Obviously, the queen couldn't get to the king, because rules, but we just want to know what the distance is, okay? Um, and so the queen has to do it in two moves. Uh, she has to move uh, axially and then diagonally. Uh, the rook's in the way, or else she could also move diagonally and axially. I had to look this up. I like trying to find the names for things. And I guess if it's not diagonal and it's vertical or horizontal, it's axial. Or well, at least that's the, that's the name of the variables that I used. So here's the, uh, here's the, um, the function that I wrote that calculates queen's distance. And you pass in columns and rows. They could be negative. That doesn't matter because we the absolute value of them, first thing that we do. Um, and then we figure out the diagonal bit and the axial bit. The, the diagonal bit to, to begin with, this bit here, we say the minimum of the how far north and uh, how far east we have to go, the minimum is the diagonal and the axial is whatever's left. So, so the maximum of these which is this, minus the minimum of these, which is this, is the axial, this. OK. And, um, and then we have to multiply the diagonal by root 2, because this length is a little bit longer than this length, whatever, whatever, you, whatever you may believe about Euclidean geometry. Uh, trust me. And um, so the, the significant thing about this um, function and the code that it generates. And again, um, you, you like uh, I had a, an easier crowd at Embo, is uh, some people are, are dealing with uh, hardware that, that maybe doesn't have a floating point um, unit, or if it does, this is the serious part of the, of like uh, the Oscars where they, they talk seriously for a minute or two. And don't smile, because they seem very serious. Uh, some people don't even have floating point units. There are people out there who are unfortunate enough that they're uh, they, uh, their computers run on batteries. So even if they do have floating point units, they're using, uh, oh, I forget the number now, I think it's uh, 10 times the silicon to, uh, to perform the, basically the same arithmetic. Um, and if you, even if you're running your machine learning algorithms uh, on, a, on a, a cloud computer, you're still burning through an awful lot of power there. Um, an absurd amount of power, especially if you're using floating point arithmetic, because it is just a lot more expensive. Nowadays, it's just, it's fast because it's highly parallelized. There's a heck of a lot more silicon being thrown at your average multiply or addition than there is um, at integer. Um, and then don't even get started on FPGAs. Uh, it becomes even more beneficial to want to use um, integer rather than floating point arithmetic. And I. I think if I squint at this, I don't think there's any floating point uh, operations here. I pointed out one or two floating point operations in uh, some code a few slides back, but there's none here. And uh, actually, this, this stuff, it really is quite easy to figure out what, which line corresponds to which, 
which are similar instructions here. Um, and again, I, I really like ARM. This 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 um, talk helped me to learn to stop worrying and and, and love the ARM. It's uh, really quite simple. So we've got the min here, and here we have a, a compare and some move if less than and move or move if greater than. That's so uh, readable. If well, if if you if you read the similar, and then the max, and you've got the similar thing. Um, and I love this um, BXLR. This is just some bizarre uh, RET instruction. I forget exactly how it works, but it's really quite sneaky. Oh yeah, it, uh, yeah. Anyway, this um, take my word for. Oh, by the way, this is uh, that's root two. That's what it actually looks like at this precision. By the way, of course, I had to drop down from exponent negative thirty because we're we're um, we're, we're having to work with larger numbers than just this value here. We might, uh, our uh, result has to um, work even if the, the queen's here and the king's there. Um, so we're, uh, we have a few more integer digits, which means we have a few fewer uh, fractional digits. Um, okay, so how far does the queen really move in chess? Five point eight two eight four uh, two seven zero seven six three three nine seven two one six seven nine six eight seven five approximately. This is actually the it's the value you will get. Um, and this one I, uh, I I went to one box because back when I wrote these slides you could not um, run uh, code in Godbolt. So the print this print this shot. There's the there's the uh, function. Here's the uh, um, a particular example, and oh, well, we had it there. That's what it prints out, and that's um, okay. Given the approximation that it's come out with, this is the exact decimal value of that approximation. Um, always ends in a five, it seems. Um, there's there's no truncating of the value um, after we've done the floating point, uh, the fixed point uh, calculation. There, these numbers can get really very long. Incidentally, there will be, I think. Uh, 24 digits here. Yeah, for every binary digit, it adds an extra decimal digit to the um, to the number when there's a fraction involved, which is uh, kind of. Oh well, let's see. Um, I don't. I, I can tell you roughly because. So here, this this was with um, an exponent of negative uh, 30. Um, we ended up using an exponent of 24. So we could kind of think of this as um, going off this way as the um, uh, the root two value that we were using. And then we had a slightly bigger number. We we're using a couple more digits. So so that's probably where we got to. Then, of course, it, it depends on what the values of these digits here are, how precise it was. I have actually have no idea. So I'm just talking to. Mask that fact. I, I, I could I could uh, check for you. Um, only approximately there, I guess. But yeah, we have twenty four um, fractional digits of precision at least, which is uh, it should be uh, good enough for most purposes. Certainly, if you're uh, going to rewrite battle chess or something like that, then uh, um, it would probably be enough. Um, okay. So now where? Okay. Right, right by zero. Errors, I think we're gonna maybe talk about errors here. So prescriptive, um, there's different, so as I said, floating point numbers, they're just uh, exponents so that you kind of never, you, um, so that the number fits nicely into the space allotted to it. And unfortunately, we don't have a, a floating bit um, exponent when we're dealing with fixed point. That's exactly what fixed point means. Um, so take a look at square root two again. Um, here's what it uh, here's what it uh, looks like. Let's see, with thirty fractional digits, and you see we are truncating some values. So you you're asking about precision loss. Whatever was was in those digits here is now lost, and that's kind of bad. So I colored it amber, which is kind of halfway between good and bad. Um, 
particularly about here, because look at all those ones we just lost. We just uh, lost most of the, the value of this bit here. Um, but still, it's way down the end from, from these integer digits. So it's not the end of the world. So it's just amber, a bit sad, not, not, too, not too sad. It's a precision loss, but in most situations, it's, uh, uh, it's not so bad. However, what if we want to do something rather convoluted, like uh, have root 32, and we decide we're going to get that by taking our root 2 variable and multiplying it by 4. Now, uh, what color do you think I've used uh, in the next uh, slide? It's not green. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so here's, here's those. Uh, and um, can anybody, can everybody at least, even if you uh, can't see the colors so great, can everybody see the, the zero and the one here? These are, these are the sad red numbers here. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, they're, they're just, there's, they've gone off the end of the, the storage that we've allocated for our number. So these, are, these, are, these um, leading zeros are assumed. They're assumed to be zero, and our assumption has been broken. So now we have a real serious error because this value and this value are way, way different. That's not good. It's overflow. So how can we deal with this? Lots of ways to deal with it. Um, one way, quite a neat way, is to use the uh, uh, constant expressions. Now, if you can... Uh, uh, if you're in a situation where you can make a variable uh, const expert like so, this is a C++ 11 feature, um, this variable will be assigned OK because uh, everything's um, hunky-dory there. But when you try and um, derive this, this value, you actually get a compiler error because um, that overflow here um, uh, that's a that's a flat out that's a bug in C plus plus and indeed C. Um, it's not a bug that's necessarily that the your tool chain is expected to diagnose for you, um, but you just have to. It's up to you to avoid ever doing this yourself. You're not guaranteed by the the, the language um, to be informed when you've made this kind of bug, um, and then anything um, might happen in your program as a result of you doing this. And so there's this. Uh, um, a strange name to describe what's going to happen in the rest of your program. Um, can anyone guess what that, that name, that phrase is? Undefined behavior, behavior. yes. Um, it's kind of the bogeyman of uh, C++, is undefined behavior. M not least because just some weird stuff might happen here, and you're not told about it. Um, you might not even find out about it until your code's in production. And then you have... Uh, um, a very humiliating bug to, to deal with. And it will seem like, well, that's really unfair that C++ didn't tell me. It knew there was a bug, but it didn't tell me that I'd written it. However, undefined behavior is not allowed in a constant expression. A constant expression has to be known at compile time. The compiler knows um, that this value, it figures out all these bits here. It knows that value. It doesn't even need to store them in the program. Uh, const expert is, uh, is a, a great keyword. It, it, uh, in all sorts of ways, it allows you to offload uh, work from the runtime to the compile time, which is great. Um, but um, because it effectively, that means it has to do all the calculation at compile time, it can um, quite easily go, okay, well, if that had run at runtime, now I know there would have been a bug as a result. Uh, there would have been undefined behavior, and I'm not going to allow undefined behavior um, in a constant expression. And so you get a compile error, which is really great. It's uh, one of the many reasons to, to use const expert where, where you can. Um, kind of a, a fun side effect. Now, if you're running stuff, uh, if you are still worried about uh, getting undefined behavior at runtime, yes, that's, uh, that's pretty serious. And just because a tool chain uh, isn't obliged to tell you when undefined behavior happens, doesn't mean there aren't tools that can. Um, and this is uh, the great thing about UB, is it leaves the, um, the, the playing field wide open for implementers to do anything they like when undefined behavior occurs. Um, and there's this, uh, what we call sanitizers, tools built into our tool chains um, that try and catch errors such as undefined behavior errors. So in GCC and Pinklang, a flag, something like this, particularly with this bit here, 
if you compile, look, there's there's our errors. We don't we don't have um, pedantic, but uh, we certainly could add it. Um, and then compile all of your code with these flags if you're worried about undefined behavior. Let's see what happens when we run this code here. Say this was in your main function. We get the runtime error. We run this, the code compiles fine. When we run it, the program traps. Basically, it pukes and dies because it's found undefined behavior that's easy to detect. And uh, it even really clearly spells out under the hood what this value is times by this value. It says that cannot be represented by int. Um, compared to so many errors that you get um, related to C++, that was pretty explicit. Uh, although it's not, it's not all C++. You can do a lot of this in C. It's fair to, to point out. Okay. However, um, there are all sorts of things which you think might be overflow. There might be this kind of error, but it turns out they're not. Um, and one of them is unsigned integers don't have overflow. They just, they never overflow. The value is wrapped around, it's truncated. So for instance, you take um, the value zero and you, and you subtract one from it, even though this is an unsigned value, that, I mean, that's negative one, or zero minus one is outside the range that any unsigned number should be able to store. So what happens when we write a program that just prints this out? It prints out a very large number. It doesn't, uh, and, and um, it's, this is well defined. Um, you can you can hunt down in the standard where it explains that exactly this will happen, given given you're on a thirty uh, machine with thirty two bit integers. And so you know if you didn't want four point three billion, uh, and it's amazing how many people seem to have convinced themselves that um, zero minus one is four point three billion in order to justify using and, and signed integers more often. If you didn't want that, then you know that's not good. Um, but we kind of expect that with unsigned. People who've, uh, who've uh, used uh, signed and unsigned integers enough kind of learn this. Um, however, ints don't always uh, um, catch what you might assume as overflow. So you take the value one, you shift it left 31 digits. Um, this is allowed. Um, it produces just a very, very small number now. One multiplied by a, a bit, I think two billion, gets you about negative two billion. That is wrong, surely. Uh, but no, I mean, this is, this is uh, allowed because apart from anything else, it's a great way to set the top bit on, on an integer if you so choose for whatever reason. Um, this one, this one was uh, even more shocking to me. Um, I think I, I, I noticed this one whilst writing these slides and I got, I was kind of demoralized to be honest because if we take the value 100,000 uh, and the range of short typically, um, does anyone know what the range of the short integer is? Typically? 32,767 uh, 32, to minus 32,768, yeah. Which is, that's not going to fit in there. Um, so what happens when we um, try and cast this large value down to a type that it cannot, can't fit in? It's defined behavior, shockingly. It does something. Um, and it, again, it describes uh, what, what's going on here, that truncation is happening, yada, yada. It kind of makes sense if you understand the assembler and what the registers are doing. But uh, um, this is the abstract machine. This is, this is something that should be where sensible things happen. Fortunately, we have another type from the, um, the CNL library called overflow integer, which sort of does what you'd expect. Um, and by default, it uh, so it has this. Uh, we've got our regular rep value here, same as um, uh, um, fixed point. But then we have this tag value. It sort of basically just uh, specifies what we want to happen when um, overflow is detected. And by default, um, undefined the undefined behavior is the tag that we want. And uh, if you have lots of fear and loathing of undefined behavior, you probably think, oh my goodness, this is a terrible, terrible idea. But bear in mind. These examples here, um, with a UB sanitizer, they were all trapped at runtime. And by the way, um, you can use undefined behavior to make your code run faster in ways that, uh, again, that was my lightning talk, but uh, um, there's all sorts of benefits to UB. Um, but it's a tag. You could change, you could change this. You could write one that, uh, that um, um, 
throw an exception if you really thought that was the best way to handle an error. Okay. And so what happens when, so these are the same expressions that are now wrapped in overflow integer and with UB sanitizer turned on. Um, runtime error, execution reached unreachable program point. Not the greatest of error, but the call stack um, uh, will have a, a message in it. Um, again, this left shift will result in a runtime error, and the um, and the, the narrowing cast results in a runtime error. The important thing is that as soon as your your um, numbers were wrong, as soon as your program is in a bad state, as soon as the program can realistically know that there's a bug in your code, uh, you don't know how your program is going to carry on running. Um, you, it might be it might be better for it to keep running if you're writing a video game. You might just want to ignore these errors and just keep going and hope nothing too bizarre happens to your your player character or, or what have you. Um, but if you're writing crazy, uh, safety critical code, um, it's probably better that your machine crashes as soon as you know that you have a bug in it, um, so that some backup system can kick in. And that's what this this guarantees uh, overflow integer. Okay, so. What if I run out of bits? Answer, the, the short answer is don't run out of bits. These are all fixed width um, values. Well, even it may be different on different architectures, but the number of bits doesn't grow at runtime. There are libraries that, uh, um, like Boost Multi Precision, can get you numbers that grow using dynamic allocation. So you just you can just keep multiplying and multiplying and they, uh, until you run out of RAM, everything's great. Or you could just use Python. Python 3, use the integers from that. Uh, they're great. Um, again, they're not just going to run out of space. Yep. Some of the two radixes. You, you mean the exponent? Do you mean the? Uh huh. Oh, I see. So you have a lower exponent as a result. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's a. Uh, I. I've. I've. I took a look at well, what happens if I multiply um, a binary fixed point with a decimal fixed point. And I sat there and looked at it for a while, and I thought, I'll figure out, that out later. Um, <laughs> what? And I, I can't wait to get onto that problem, but I'm going to have to lock myself in a room for a while. And um, questions like that, you know, how do the radix and the exponent interact like that? Um, uh, yes, that, 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 that will come up, I think. Oh, the exponent. OK, yes, now that's far clearer. That actually does happen. Uh, if I go back to, um, where is it? Yeah. So is this what you mean, where we have like the value 1,000 and we multiply 1,000 by 1,000 and we get something where the exponents got added together? <laughs> yeah, a, uh, an integer is a fixed point number which has a, an exponent of zero. And um, I actually sort of modeled fixed point around trying to hold that assumption. So, yeah, it does still hold that you'll get the same exponent out. And you can have fixed point with exponent zero, and it behaves just like it was the rep type. Um, okay. So, but yes, uh, good, good question. But you have, you have nothing that changes the underlying representation after multiplication. Well, so you sure I do. Oh, you're a, we're a slide away from answering that question. Um, however, um, bear in mind, uh, say, let's say you add a short to another short. What is the result going to be? What type is the result going to be? Again, next slide. The in C. 
let's say we're, we're talking C here. Um, so if you add or multiply two short integers together, there's something called promotion, which kicks in. Um, and again, that goes back to me ranting about how you shouldn't do arithmetic in 8-bit in or 16-bit or because um, the processor doesn't have 8-bit registers. I mean, forget about SIMD. It doesn't have 8-bit registers. It doesn't have 16-bit registers. It only has 32-bit registers. The first thing it has to do is load both of those shorts or those in, the 8-bit uh, numbers into 32-bit registers anyway. Um, and that's modeled in the abstract machine using what we call promotion. So even aside from the exponent, when you multiply two um, fixed point numbers together, or say two overflows, let's say um, um, we had uh, short in here, and then we shifted by an int, um, the result would still be, it wouldn't be short, it would be 32-bit, um, uh, because the underlying integer shift was 32-bit. Um, if we were subtracting, excuse me, let's say we made this um, uh, int 8, and then we added um, negative 1 to it. Well, we get back overflow of int, because um, overflow integer observes, uh, kind of respects the promotional behavior of the rep type, no matter what it might be. But it's not going to go from int to long. Uh, no, it that's, won't go to that's, int from that's long. Not a that's a problem, isn't it? Yeah, it's a real problem. If only there was a solution. <laughs> only there was a solution to all these problems, because promotion is quite useful where it works. And if you've used C or C++ for a long time, and then you learn about promotion, you think, my goodness, how many bugs did I avoid writing because my results ended up being way wider than I thought they were going to be? Um, however, um, this stuff stops at 32-bit. Um, and then you run out of bits. So yeah, your numbers might grow. And so I have da -da -da, elastic integer, which is, which is exactly what you've all been crying out for, clearly. Um, so this type, it, has a, it doesn't have a rep type. It has another sort of time name type, a, a thing um, that takes int. Uh, and then it has a number of digits. No, not bits, digits. Same thing as uh, numeric limits, digits. Um, what is the limit of this elasticity? Uh, well, digits, I mean, right, that's a very deep question. Um, that, depends, that depends partly on this, this type here, um, and then this number here, how they're combined. Um, probably better if I um, show you some of the examples and, and, and see uh, um, what you make of it, I think. So let's, let's take the example of, a th we've got 1,000 again. Let's say we multiply it by itself, and then we square that again. So 1,000 raised to the 4, that's a big, it's just a big number, OK? It's also the same as a million squared, which is uh, a trillion, just a trillion. OK, and uh, you, you spot the pattern here. I've pointed it out before. Um, These numbers here are doubling in width each time. And they exceed, this is more than, this is 40, 40 bits. Yeah, 40 bits right here. Here's what elastic integer does with this, uh, how it represents this kind of multiplication here. So we have, uh, we're using the, our, our um, use defined literal again. So the value 1000, elastic integer, when it's initialized with it, it looks at that number. It's not now looking for the, um, the trailing zeros. It's looking for these significant numbers here. And so, well, it's looking at the whole thing together. And it figures out, well, to represent the value 1,000, you need 10 digits. And so that's the, that's the, uh, the value it deduces um, for this template parameter. Um, and then so when you square this number, you get this is the, uh, this is the behavior that we've been looking for. It, it accurately, it adds the widths of the things together. Uh, we'll get to the exponent in, the, in a bit, but this avoids the overflow here. It, it now knows if you multiply these two numbers together, we need something with 20 bits. Um, and the significant thing about this is that this is all um, 
compile time computation. It's doing the thing that I mentioned that Python and Boost multi precision do of figuring out, oh, we need more bits. But it's doing it at compile time. Obviously, there's, there's limitations to this, but uh, this is quite powerful because we're, uh, instead of trying to detect overflow and then emit undefined behavior, uh, in, instead of actually having to do a check at runtime, um, we're avoiding needing to do the check at compile time by guaranteeing we're going to have a type that's, that's going to have enough capacity for any values that we throw at it. And again, here, now when we um, multiply these two values and we know we've got a, we have, need a 40 bit number, most likely int is 32 bits, 31 digits, um, and we need more um, capacity. So the rep type underneath will become long, long. If it takes int, it says, okay, give an int, give me something back that has at least 40 digits of width. And uh, so we can, we're able to, um, to expand something that's going to be, be a 64-bit number. Um, now, where does the elasticity end? That's the question, isn't it? Um, on, um, on a Windows machine, that, that's, that's your lot. You get to 63 um, digits, and then you'll get a compiler error. You'll, you'll be told um, this, this doesn't fit anymore in our machine registers. GCC or Clang? On a on a thirty a sixty four bit architecture, there is a one hundred and twenty eight bit integer, and uh, CNL will make use of that. Now, if you want to use some kind of wide integer, some fixed width wide integer instead of int, you can do that. Um, I have actually written one. I don't mention it in this talk, but I've written a, an integer that goes past the the sixty four and the one hundred and twenty eight bit boundaries. Um, it's maybe not the most efficient, but at least it's avoiding these errors. It's it's really it was really it's like a star set central simplified version of multiple int. Yes, it is. Yeah, but simplified. Uh, one of the hardest things was making it constant, um, a constant expression. I know the author of multi precision has been working on making boost multi precision constant expert as well, and it's I, I have great Schadenfreude in in seeing him say this is quite tricky because um, uh, my naive attempts just eight months of my time trying to get that to work and. And as yet, does not produce very nice code, but it gets the job done. Um, and I hope at some point to to improve on the performance. So yeah, you can just keep multiplying ad infinitum, and um, you you guaranteed you're not ever going to get overflow here. So there are, there are limits, and we are sort of leaving more and more of these zero digits on the floor. And of course, we don't want that. Um, we already have um, a separate type. That deals with that separate concern, and uh, does anybody remember what the C in CNL stands for? Compositional, yes, composite. These types can be stuck together. And here now, now that you've under, I've hopefully tried to explain fixed point and elastic number. Here is an alias. Sorry, fixed point and elastic integer. Here is an alias elastic number, which globs them together here. So. Here in the, with fixed point, you have a rep type and an exponent. The rep type up until now has been int or maybe int eight. Now it's an elastic integer. And um, I have a new user defined literal which returns values of this elastic, of this um, elastic number, this uh, um, composition of two different types. And they work uh, in unison very, very well indeed. So this, this value here. It's going to be deduced as being an elastic number with width seven and exponent three. So it knows that you need seven actual digits plus the side bit, and then the uh, uh, exponent of three. And let's see how that helps us with our previous example. Um, that's a very good answer to that. Now, once once this stuff is standardized. The underscore is taken away. Um, there's a rule saying unless your user find literal is part of the, the C++ standard, you have to put an underscore in to make to make it clear that it's a user land user find literal. So once we get rid of the underscore and it's just an E, the parser can't tell that it's not a hexadecimal digit. Same as C, um, which is unfortunate. We won't I won't be able to use C either. Um, that's yeah, that, that, that's sad, but. Uh, that, yeah, it's, um, it's an interesting kind of gotcha. I remember somebody posting a comment on, on GitHub saying, oh, by the way, this isn't going to work when you get to it. And I was going, 
wow, that's brilliant. Uh, thank goodness somebody pointed it out to me. Uh, of, of course, this is going to be just as big a problem, but I'd, uh, I'd check that in by the time I realized what the mistake was. But let's see what, see what happens here. Um, uh, oh, we're going back in the wrong direction. Okay, so here is, the, here is the old slide where I'm just using elastic integer. And it's using 10 digits, 20 digits, 40 digits. Now here, this um, composite type, using seven, seven digits and an exponent of three, now 14 digits, exponent of six, 28 digits, and an exponent of, exponent of 12. And um, the nice thing about that is we now don't need a 64-bit number to store uh, a, a trillion, which is a win. Okay, so what if your numbers grow? Alternative answer, stretch. All right, adaptive range. And, uh, oh my God, I'm gonna speed up, sorry. Thank you, you're also very patient. Um, so, what if you can't stretch or you won't stretch? What other alternatives are there? Well, this is just me kind of showing off at this point. This stuff is, uh, is um, of, of some interest and uh, hopefully I've sort of I got you into the, the mindset using this notation where uh, you can see some of the even more wacky things that this library is capable of. Well, so here we go back to our square root two um, of 30 digits. Um, and what happens now if we want to uh, multiply by four? Remember we tried multiplying by four before and it didn't go too well. We had, uh, I had to use the red digits and we don't want red digits anymore. So here, instead of shifting left by two, which is another way of multiplying by four, right? Um, we're shifting uh, left by constant two. So that's a compile time known constant. Um, and as we saw before, this thing can affect the, the actual type, not just the value, but the type. Um, and so what this thing does, it actually adjusts the exponent left by a couple of digits from 30 to 28. So this now fits in. I mean, we're uh, sure we're gonna, no, we're not actually truncating anything, are we? Because uh, all we've changed is where the decimal point is. And actually, uh, this, bit, this looks like a hack, well it is. Uh, for elastic, that actually is a one bit number with an exponent of uh, uh, three, two, one. Exponent of one, yeah. Two, two. Um, and um, this would have been much easier if I just shifted by one bit. But uh, okay, so yeah, it's an elastic number of yeah, um, one comma two, and it when you multiply, uh, there's a special rule where if you know that a number is only one bit, you know you don't need to add that extra one bit to the width of the uh, the result. If it's one of the, the incoming operands, and uh, so that little hack means that we don't need to use this slightly hacky sort of low-level notation. We can use multiply, and uh, we still get the same result. Um, but what does the code gen for something like this look like? Well, in the case of the shift, uh, this is the return um, um, instruction that I mentioned before. This isn't actually doing anything. It puts in on the stack. It says, "Hey." Um, make this number four times as much. Um, and then the compiler says, okay, it's four times as much. It just returns a different type with a different exponent, doesn't actually do any runtime work at all. And the same for, same for the multiplication there. So uh, it's, it's kind of, well, if you talk about zero cost abstractions, this is kind of uh, like a negative cost abstraction in, 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 a, in a way, I like to. If you kind of squint, kind of a negative cost abstraction. Um, maybe of not much use, but uh, it's, um, makes me happy. So don't stretch if you can't stretch and won't stretch, well, depending on how you do it. Rather contrived example, I'll, I'll admit. So to round up, um, obviously I was exercising you throughout the, the talk. Um, have we learned something today? Um, well, yes. Yes, we have. And here's what we've learned. Two infinity plus eight. Infinity plus one. Infinity plus three. Two infinity plus 24. Three. Fixed point 42 underscore C. 
not 14, but one, that, that big number, don't stretch, and don't stretch. Yes, or as Mr. Streve Reveling would, would, would put it, I've learned from my mistakes, and if asked to reproduce them, I, I think I could do perfectly. So uh, thank you for uh, your patience. Um, uh, are there any questions? Uh, thanks for the, the, the great comments. Um, we'll brush over the answers you gave to some of those uh, questions because that was a bit embarrassing for you all. But thanks for the, for the other comments. Um, are there any questions that you saved to the end? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, um, well. So that one, that one was showing how you avoid floating point. And um, another one I like to use is trying to trying to test whether a point is within inside a, a sphere or a circle, because that only requires um, uh, you compare radius squared to x squared plus y squared. So you never actually have to do the square root. As soon as you need to do something like a square root. Then the floating point hardware is is decades of uh, um, hard work making those uh, operations very very fast, and it's going to be a while to catch up um, with uh, floating point units when you have to do something like a square root. But to test whether a point lies within a circle, you don't actually need to perform the square root, um, and so it, that compiles out to very nice integer arithmetic. Very nice indeed. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, I I mean. In previous talks, I've given examples of uh, applications of this. I mentioned the uh, the cost savings in terms of silicon and energy. Um, the determinism's uh, a good point as well. We were talking about uh, um, how you might lose precision or you might lose determinism when you use floating point numbers because of some of the complexities involved with floating point numbers. Um, if you switch the, the variables around in, in ways that shouldn't make have a diff make, make a difference, like if you add a lot of numbers together, you add them in a different order, you, you get a slightly different result. Um, that's not the case with integers, and therefore it's not the case with fixed point. Um, also, yeah, I mean, and, and for that reason, uh, and, and wanting to be able to represent some values with the um, same precision, no matter how big those numbers are, floating point doesn't get you that. It's very, very precise with small numbers, less precise with large numbers, and in things like um, uh, physical simulations, where you want to just express position in the world, um, floating point can actually uh, um, cause various problems. There's there's a video game that, that raised about a quarter of a billion dollars on some crowdfunding um, uh, fundraising venture, um, Citizen something or I forget the name of it. But they they, they then spent a lot of this money simulating Star Citizen. Star Citizen. One of the things they they discover when you've got a quarter of a billion dollars, you want to try and um, simulate entire galaxies and certainly whole solar systems. And they tried to do this in floating point, and then they realized when they got very far from the sun, everything was jumping by large increments because the precision was lost. And uh, so then they had to move to double. That's only get, going to get them so far into the galaxy before they realize they need my fixed point library. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's, a, that's another example. All the things that the reasons why you'd use integers, but they don't do fractions. That's that's where a fixed point is trying to um, f uh, fill a hole there. Yeah. Any any other questions? Right. Yeah. Does it grow in number? It, it, it grows the same way that um, integer error grows. And by the way, when you have a, a fractional number and you, and you add a bunch of those fractional numbers together, you don't lose any precision at all because the exponent is only um, kind of growing. When you multiply two integers together, you don't lose you don't lose the, the, the lowest digit or the second lowest digit, do you? Um, the number just keeps growing off, off to the left. And that's what you get with the fixed point numbers. When the exponent is adjusted, you're getting a lossless um, multiplication. Now, admittedly, if you then have to cast back to the original 
variable, then that's that's that cast is going to do the truncation. But with um, that's that's something you can avoid if you if you want to. And uh, for, so with floating point numbers, all the time you are you're dropping whatever the um, the lower digits that you don't have room for are. You just keep dropping those. Um, I f forget where I was. Oh, the uh, you wanted to know exactly what the uh, um, error is going to be. Well, you just take one multiplied by the radix of the exponent. That's what your unit of least precision is, your, your epsilon. You always know that that'll be it. And uh, numeric limits is defined for this type. So you can do numeric limits of um, min, I think, and it'll get you the, the, the tiniest value um, that you can represent there. Um, there's another type, um, rounding integer, which then deals with the, the problem of um, how integers always truncate. Um, but that one again is um, it's a bit costly. It has to do calculation at runtime to um, to get you good, nice rounding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, at the, yeah. But at the end of the day, if you want if you want that much precision and and that larger a universe, you need a lot of digits. Um, that's why I um, when I I was talking about um, where how to store these numbers. That's why I say always um, you know always work to the right here um, because it's easier to detect overflow and then go okay well I need a wider integer or use elastic integers. And here you're not losing um, to the right here. You're you're not losing any precision, so you can get those ridiculously wide numbers if you want. You have to be aware that you need to pay for them. And and floating point is very very useful. You know, if you go to the if you do your transformations right, you can in in Grand Theft Auto you can run miles and miles and miles and then go and uh, and it works out because they they um, they were very careful about how they did things. Uh, more often than not, they're resetting the origin as 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 you move. But um, uh, yeah, floating point. You you got to weigh up the pros and cons. Floating point is incredibly powerful, and the and the, the technology behind it is amazing. If you can afford it, um, it's it's very often the best choice. Absolutely. Yeah. The values remain the same, but the operation gets performed and the precision is also maintained. So, can you compress the bits? Lossless compression. Yeah. Um, that really depends on the algorithm, I think. You can certainly use fixed fixed points to um, express um, RGB values, for instance. You can use a, a like a, a radix of two five five and an exponent of negative one. And, you, and right there, you have your, your typical RGB true color values. Uh, compression, though, uh, I think it would really depend on, I'd have to understand exactly what the, the algorithm is. Um, you could, but anytime you're using um, an integer to represent a, a, a real number, um, certainly it can help you trying to figure out what you're doing and stop you from making mistakes, like forgetting to add an exponent here or there. Uh, any other? Questions? Um, just one thing about the my boss tried your library about two years ago. All right. And he had difficulty with division. I know you didn't want to talk about division. Yeah. But I presume division <laughs> is implemented in the current version. It is, and you get um, integer division. Um, I might turn. Uh, I don't know if I really have time to, to show you this. I've got slides where. I show you how the integer division works, but it just works like integer division. Sometimes it's it's a bit wacky what the results are because you're always expecting an exponent of zero, but you get um, you get lossless division provided you keep your remainder, provided you use your uh, percent your modulo operation. You can you can perform division that doesn't lose any precision at all, but you get also other weird things like for instance, anytime you take a an integer number and divide it by any larger integer number, you always get zero. As a result, um, and the way that manifests in fixed point is that the, the the result always has exponent zero, and it and it 
catastrophically truncates all of your precision. And there are ways around that. It's, it's a very interesting open topic in terms of the API design. But certainly you can have something similar to floating point division, or you can have integer floating point division. But um, the floating one requires an extra shift, basically. It's more expensive. It requires more width. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a whole other another 60 minutes. And I've already taken about two hours with this 60 minutes. So, how, so question, how, how long is 60 minutes? It's about, it's about two hours. So thank you very much for uh, staying the, the, the course. Uh, but yeah, hopefully it uh, won't be too long before I, I see you next time. Yeah, thank you. And uh, please take a car. We are hiring. <laughs> <laughs>